Right, welcome this evening, everyone. Welcome to our Ascension Day Bible study. Uh, it's really good to be with you tonight, and it's always uh, wonderful for us to open God's Word, and especially on this special day for us to remember um, the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we trust that you'll be encouraged this evening as we consider God's Word. Um, it's more of a Bible study format, so please feel free to ask some questions. Um, but really, it's good to good to be together. We're going to open in prayer. And thank the Lord for this time and then turn to his word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this evening. And we thank you, Lord, as we remember your ascension, as you ascended into the heavenlies after the work was done. We thank and praise you for what this day means to us and what it represents. And Lord, although the world does not remember this as much, um, it, it seems to be Sort of skipped over even in the Christian calendar. We thank you that as a church we can be reminded of this day, study your word together, and really focus our hearts and minds on this important event. And we just pray this evening you'll give to us insight and wisdom as we study your word together. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So uh, please take some notes this evening. Um, I have some notes. So if you would like my notes, I can email it to you afterwards. Just contact me. But um, otherwise, take some notes this evening. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, so tonight being Ascension Day, and today being Ascension Day, and tonight we're studying God's Word on it, um, it's very important, I feel, for us to consider God's Word on the Ascension because it's not really something we focus on. We know that we have Good Friday and, and, and Easter Sunday, we focus on those, we'll focus on Pentecost. And it just seems that it, the ascension gets sort of skipped over. Um, depending on what country you're in, uh, as South African, we had this as a public holiday when I was a, a child. So we would have services in school and things like that. And it was mm -hmm. a sort of traditional thing. Um, but it just is important as I sort of work through the theology behind the ascension and why it's important. I just find it very important. So annually as a church, we try and, and, and set this day aside and just study God's word on the ascension, which I trust will be encouraging to you this evening. So if you could turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 24, we're just going to read from verse 44 to 53 and then look at Acts chapter one, of course, which is where specifically the ascension is focused on. So, so just Luke 24 verse 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to, to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Yes. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were cont continually in the temple, praising and blessing uh, God. Amen. So let's let's turn to Acts chapter 1, and then we'll consider these important verses. So Acts chapter 1, just reading from verse, verse 1 to 11. It's actually quite significant, as you would know. We, we read from Luke chapter 24, and of course, it's the Gospel of Luke, and here we look at Acts, which is also written by Luke. So there's a, there's a clear connection here. So Luke writes in Acts chapter 1, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining 
to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall, be, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadily or steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So just a few things for us from by way of introduction. Um, we're going to look at the importance of the ascension theologically and biblically. Because there are a few things we, we have to be reminded of why the ascension is very important. Because if we think about it logically, why did Jesus not just stay? Why did he not just stay and usher in the kingdom and then move forward from there? And we can say yes, because it's God's purpose, 100%. But there was more to the picture, more to what needed to be done. And it's something often we don't emphasize as, as Christians in our study of the scriptures. The importance of prophecy being fulfilled. So when Jesus spoke in Luke 24, he clearly told the apostles and the disciples that certain things had to be fulfilled. It's the prophets spoke about even the Psalms. So the ascension is part of a fulfillment of prophecy. And, and, and this is also very important because often what happens is there's this, this, this lazy assumption that many Christians make. The Old Testament's for Israel. As soon as the New Testament starts, that's now for the church. That's lazy. It's not biblically accurate. Because what we see in the ascension, what we see in the crucifixion, is still part of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the prophecies of the Old Testament being fulfilled. And we have to ask questions relating to what the Old Testament said about the death and resurrection of Christ, and even the ascension. So these things are very, very important. So that's the, these are the questions tonight we have to ask as, as those who are really wanting to know what God's word has to say. But firstly, why was the ascension important? Firstly, because if Jesus Christ did not ascend into heaven, the Holy Spirit would not be able to come and fulfill his ministry. And you'll find that, of course, in John chapter 16, that it was necessary for Christ to ascend so the Holy Spirit could then descend and it ushered in his very specific ministry. Because the Holy Spirit's always been there. He's always been at work in the lives of people, always fulfilling um, his role in a general sense. But it was necessary for, for Christ to ascend so the Holy Spirit could come and fulfill the very important part of that ministry. Which was to immerse people into Christ. Very important. And that's the long, that's the sort of bigger picture. But immediately then it was the Holy Spirit would come and empower the believers to fulfill a very specific purpose. But in the long term, it is the Holy Spirit's specific ministry to take a person and baptize them into the Lord Jesus Christ. So unless Christ ascends, the Holy Spirit can't fulfill his ministry. Also, the ascension was very important because it was a confirmation of the work of the cross. So Jesus Christ dies, the resurrection is a confirmation, and the ascension is a confirmation of the work of Christ and what was accomplished on the cross, because Jesus Christ ascends into the heavenlies, according to the book of Hebrews. He ascends into the heavenlies with that finished work, with the blood of, the, of, of his sacrifice, entering in to the Holy of Holies of heaven and presenting that work as finished and complete. So the ascension also confirmed that that work 
was complete, it was accepted, and Christ was about to enter into his heavenly ministry. Kenneth? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I, um, excuse me for being a bit thick, but in terms of Christ had to ascend in order for the, to allow the Holy Spirit to come down in a sort of new way, but why couldn't uh, the the basic question on um, um, possibly is on others' lips as well is why couldn't the two happen at the same time on earth, so to speak? I'm just going on the words of Jesus in John 16. Right. So Jesus, Jesus says in his own words, it's it's yeah. necessary that I go so the comforter will come. It's part yeah. of God's purpose. So, yeah. It's one of these issues that maybe we can't fully understand logically why that is but it's no, just... it, no it's not just a logic thing kenny it, it, it's it's a purpose thing because jesus christ took on flesh for a purpose yeah and he fulfilled a role for a purpose and that's generally what critics don't understand of, of the of, of of the gospels when jesus speaks of the father and he speaks in the way he does it is because he's taken on flesh and he has a very specific ministry and that ministry had a purpose to be fulfilled. When that ministry was fulfilled on earth, he ascends and the Holy Spirit then comes to fulfill his role. So the, the Holy Spirit can, of course, be here when Christ is here, but it's not the purpose. The purpose is for, for the Trinity to fulfill a very specific purpose in ministry. Right. And so Christ needed to ascend because that was the purpose of God. So the Holy Spirit would then come and fulfill his work in the life of the believer. So it's all about purpose. Right. It's not about, it can't happen. Anything can happen. God can do anything. But he chose to fulfill the purpose like that. And that's why. But Christ in his own words said, I have to ascend. Otherwise, the comforter will not come. In the role of the comforter. Because the whole word comforter is basically the Greek word parakletos. The one that walks beside. Right. Yeah. And so there's there's a purpose in that. Yeah. Yeah. Also... The third thing you said there, sorry, uh, mm. the, it confirmed what? It confirmed his death, burial, and resurrection, is it? Or something to yes, do with that? yes. It confirmed the, the finished work and that he then entered into the Holy of Holies with that finished work to, to assume the position, which is the third mm. point, which is his high priestly work. Mm -hmm. That now he enters in, he has to ascend to enter into heaven to fulfill the purpose that the book of Hebrews speaks about, that Jesus Christ is now our high priest. And that's why the ascension needed to take place, which is very, very important. Right. It's important for him to fulfill his high priestly role. It, it's, it's the key to the whole book of Hebrews. Because it, it shows that the old covenant priestly role that fulfilled his purpose, and Jesus Christ now is the high priest yeah. in the heavenlies. So the ascension had to take place for that to, take, to happen, mm. which is very important. Also, fourthly, the high priestly, I mean, it's, it's a bit of theological dynamics, but the high priestly role was very specific to the book of Hebrews. You won't find generally in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle speak about Christ as a high priest per se. Because uh, Paul the Apostle emphasizes the other aspect to Christ's work, which is that he had to ascend to assume the position of Lord and head of the body. Because Paul always lifts the Christian's head upward, um, look to heaven where Christ is seated. Mm. That's the position he has. You, I mean, I think if you do a study on it, you can Google it. It's very rare. I think there's about four or five occasions where Paul the Apostle would speak of Jesus only. 99% of the time when Paul the Apostle speaks of Jesus Christ, he will say the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he highlights the Christian's gaze to be lifted up into the heavenly position that Christ assumes. And that's why Colossians 3 is so important. Set your affections on things above. And therefore, as Christians, we, we try and steer clear, and we should, of this Jesus guru picture that Christians often have in these books of you know following Jesus. Um, and it, it's a very sort of earthly guru-like mentality, which is not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is heavenly. It's far beyond the, the trappings of earth. And so that's why the ascension was also very, very important. And then in the heavenlies, Christ 
again, it comes back to even Kenny's question of, of why. Again, a lot of these things we ask why, but it's God's purpose. That even in heaven, Christ fulfills a work. That he is the intercessor. He is the high priest. He is the advocate. He is Lord. He's the one that we look to who is, is, is the head of the body. He fulfills important ministries in heaven. And therefore, he had to ascend. But this is where we really drive this home tonight, which I hope that we can we can really wrestle with and think through. Because when we read the Old Testament, what is clear is that the death of Jesus Christ is part of prophecy. Now, nothing about the death of Christ was a surprise to the prophets, nor a surprise to God, of course. But the death of Christ was part of prophecy. And also the ascension was part of prophecy. And why do I highlight that? Because throughout Jesus Christ's ministry, he knew Israel would reject him. And not the fact that he knew they would reject him in a general sense. He knew they would reject him because the Old Testament declared they will reject him. Yeah. So when Jesus dies on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's because he knows what they're doing and he understands that process. And, and why I highlight that and from, a, from a biblical perspective, why I drive that home is that people think that Israel was cut off because they crucified Christ. No, mm. the Old Testament declared they would. They knew that. So nothing that happened from the crucifixion to the ascension was outside the ambit of prophecy because it was prophesied. And so let's look at, um, at Psalm 110 because the cross and the ascension was part of prophecy and both of those aspects was part of prophecy with the assumption of the kingdom clearly in that same picture so that the kingdom will not come and cannot come until the Messiah dies. The kingdom cannot come until the Messiah ascends. So it's always been part of prophecy to have the picture of the Messiah dying, the Messiah being raised from the dead, the Messiah ascending into heaven, and then anticipating the Messiah's return. Because I leave this with you once again, we're going to talk about it a bit later, but Zechariah 14, when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, the anticipation in the Old Testament is that the Messiah returns. And so when you read that in connection with Isaiah and Zechariah, yes, because many Jews would only see one advent, but that's because they're limited in that understanding. We understand the bigger picture, that it was always part of prophecy that the Messiah would die, the Messiah would be resurrected, the Messiah would ascend, and there would be a period of time until his return. That's always been part of prophecy. So let's look at Psalm 110. So... Um, so I'm going to quickly turn there because, of course, the speaker is a bit late on the on the uptake there. Incompetence here from me. But anyway, Psalm 110. And um, I'm going to look at from verse 1, of course. It says here, now this is, of course, David speaking. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, that passage is clearly assuming an ascension. And the reason why is because the whole point of the Messiah is to come to earth and give his life and then to sit at the right hand of the Father until the enemies are made a footstool. And so when we look at that passage in Psalm 110, there are a few things that are clear there. Firstly, the fact that it says your enemies means that the Lord was to be rejected according to prophecy. Christ was to be rejected. Secondly, Christ was to be honored because he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And therefore, he is honored. Why? According to Scripture, he's honored because he gave his life. He was faithful unto death. Thirdly, the enemies of God are to be punished. 
because the enemies will be made a footstool. Fourthly, this was to happen in his absence because he is seated in the heavenlies until the enemies are made his footstool. And that's where the tribulation comes in, that God uses the tribulation to start making the enemies footstools. So we have, the Lord has to be rejected. He will then be honored. The enemies will be punished. And this will all happen in his absence from earth. And it was to end with his enemies under his feet. Because the enemies will be made a footstool. And therefore the ascension is so important because it fulfills the purpose that God has laid out in the Old Testament that Christ was to die and Christ will ascend. And the question is, for what purpose? To start fulfilling the purpose of God prophetically. So Kenneth, when mm. you say that, um, obviously it is clear, you're right, that it's prophesied in the Old Testament that these things have to take place. So why was it that the, neither disciples or, you know, that there wasn't much teaching, it doesn't seem to be the case, in uh, the Jewish faith then about this, that, that they were sort of ignorant of it, even though it was prophesied? How do we explain that? Because the Jews would often understand the sufferings of the, the Messiah in relation to the suffering of the nation. Oh, got you. So they would read it collectively, that it's part of the nation's suffering. So the Jews only saw one advent. Right. So the nation would suffer and the Messiah would return to redeem them. That right. was, so the picture we have of the earthly ministry of Christ wasn't their understanding. It was God's, but it wasn't theirs. Right. We now, I read this now based upon what the New Testament declares. We look back. We can see it. Can't so this we? is not a, this is not an indictment upon them. Oh, how do they not see? It was difficult at times. I'm going back and saying there are clear prophecies, and yeah. the New Testament fills in those gaps clearly by telling us these things. Right. So that's why I'm looking back with that. Yeah. But the question is once again is this thinking that, oh, okay, Christ ascends and now Christianity starts. But the question is, it's not that simple because what happens with Christ ascending is still part of prophecy. Yeah. And those how, are the how things wise... that we wrestle with. Sorry, David? No, no. Um, how widespread is the idea in Isaiah 53 that it applies to the nation? Oh, it's it's general rabbinical thinking. If you were okay, debating, general. With, yeah, general rabbinical thinking, they would they would see that as a collective, and that's why I would advise against just using Old Testament passages without really studying them, because I I preach the the, the songs the the suff, the sort of servant songs they call it, and the sufferings, and 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 there is a collective element to how the word can be used as well. And they would choose to look at that interpretation of it. And I think the rabbis, even of today, take that view, don't they? Of course Bye. they would. Of course they would. Because they, if they don't, then of course it, it fits Christ, which they don't want. Absolutely. <laughs> That's true. So, so there's important aspects to prophetically why Christ ascends. Also, we move on to the twofold purpose in the ascension. There's a twofold purpose in it. The reason why Christ ascended was also to allow the apostles and his followers to prepare the ground for the kingdom. And I'll explain that when we look at Acts chapter 1. And, and we're going to look at Luke as well when we get into the text. But there was a preparation for the kingdom. It was part of the Old Testament picture of before the Messiah returns then, there is a preparation, there is... Because if you look um, sort of at the, at, at the prophets and the anticipation of there's a spreading, there's a light, there's, a, there's an illumination that takes place pre-second coming. So the first purpose of the ascension was to 
basically prepare the ground for the preaching of the kingdom. And that's important. And also, from a Christian perspective, then we understand that the ascension was necessary for Christ to fulfill his heavenly ministry and for us as Christians to have our affection set in the heavenlies. So clearly what we see in the ascension is a, is a twofold purpose. One that the disciples fulfilled and the apostles, but then one that has longevity to a, to a fuller picture that the kingdom hadn't come and therefore our gaze is drawn upward. So turn with me to, 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 to Luke chapter 24. And I just want to look at one or two aspects there before we. So, so what you explain there, Kenneth, is this is one of the few instances where, to put it sort of in a very blunt, view, you get you get a mixture of Israel and the church almost. That's yeah, hundred percent. Why? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, but okay. again, the, uh, you get a mixture of it, but the. Greatest content is kingdom, which we'll explain in a bit. So when we look at, at Luke 24, look at verse 44, it says, And then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The death, the resurrection, the ascension, these are all part of things that were written in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Very important. But then look at verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. They'd spend three years with Christ. It's not that they don't know the Bible, the Old Testament. They don't, they don't know the Old Testament. But he made them understand the fuller, bigger purpose and picture. And this is important. Hold on to that. Um. And look at verse 46, Christ then says, thus it is written, this, and, this, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. It has to happen. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We're going to build on that. And um, then verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. So, he spends that time with them. He opens the scriptures to them. He explains the prophets, the law of Moses, and Psalms. And I just highlight that because I like to defend the disciples quite vehemently that these were not ignorant men. <laughs> they knew what they needed to know. And I want us to hold on to that because they spent 40 days with Jesus. And he opened the scriptures to them. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. And now we're going to look at this text in, in more detail. So Acts chapter 1. We look at verse 2. Um, it says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. What were these commandments? What commandments did he give to his apostles? And this is a very rhetorical, theological question that I always want to pose to people. Spending 40 days with Jesus. So they spend 40 days with Jesus. He opens the scriptures to you and he tells you exactly what to do. So again, were these ignorant men? Did they not understand? Were they completely unaware of what God's purpose was? That's the question. No, they weren't. And I just want us to hold on to that. Because look at what the commandments were. And what did Jesus say? What is the, the greatest commandment that, that people generally use is the Great Commission. So Jesus yeah. commands them to go into all the world and make disciples yeah. of all nations. Not so? Yeah. Okay? But they knew exactly what to do. Yeah. So turn with me to Acts 11, verse 19. So Acts 11, verse 19. Oops. So turn yeah. with me to Acts 11, verse 19. 
Okay. So I would, I don't know because everyone can see me probably on the recording. So I, I want to have a thumbs up that everyone's with me. So the disciples spent 40 days with Jesus. They were very aware of what the scriptures taught because Christ opened the scriptures to them. They knew exactly what to do. Are we all in agreement with that? Or did they not know? Well, yes and no. They were still, they still hadn't quite got the idea that the kingdom was postponed. No, but he didn't say that to them. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying that. No, that's no, a wide... but, yeah, but he, they didn't even tell them that. Did they know everything they needed to know at the time? Yes, yeah. So let's look at Acts 11, verse 19. It says, um, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Sorry, what chapter was this again? 11, was it? Acts, Acts 11, verse 19. So those who were scattered after Stephen, when traveling, only preached to Jews. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is the question, um, how did they understand uh, the so-called Great Commission? Is it's how the they understood it. It's what it is, Miriam. So you're actually quite perceptive in your question. I, I want to raise this. It's not what they understood it to, to be in the sense of they interpreted it. It's what it is. Yeah. So when you look at Luke 24, which you just read, it says, and this message will go out. Where does it start? It starts in Jerusalem. 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 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, is Acts 1 8. And you'll be witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. What I'm just trying to highlight is that Christ ascends and he leaves a very specific command to the 12. And that command is to go to everyone indiscriminately? No, it's not. It's a, it's a sequential thing in that he says, Jerusalem first, then Judea. Yes. Then Samaria, which is the the rest of Israel. Yes, and then the and then the. Yeah. But they never got beyond. Every single time in the Book of Acts, they returned back to Jerusalem. Yes. Wasn't it only Paul who was commissioned to go to the Gentiles? Hundred percent, hundred percent, Melody. Because the key here is, and I'm just trying to build on the ascension. What they knew. So Christ ascends. He leaves them very specific commandments. And the commandments were that your focus is, yes, the message will go to the world, but your immediate focus is to reach the Jews. But so did, they, un did they understand that they would, but they would do it in this order and yes. they never, ever got any further? Because not, basically there was no revival taking place in Israel. That was, so they were just frustrated in their efforts? No, not frustrated. Frustrated is the wrong word. They would just persist. I mean, it was basically saying, for me as a pastor, I'm frustrated because the church <laughs> folk aren't growing. No, it's not. that's not it. It's being faithful to what your calling is. And right. we see this even in Galatians chapter 2. What did Peter say to Paul? What did Paul and Peter agree on? Peter will focus on? Uh, Jews. circumcision Jews, Jews and, and, and Paul will go. All on, what yeah. I'm just trying to build on with the ascension why it's important is that the commission that was left with the 12 was the commission they were faithful to at no point in the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts is God saying that the, the, the apostles and those following them are unfaithful by not going out yet they were 100% faithful to what their calling was which was to keep it there, preach in, in, in Israel and the surrounds, until God says otherwise. And I just but leave there is with a, you. Isn't there a slight complication there? Because w what Jesus told them to preach was repent and the offer of the kingdom is there. 100%. Until they would hear otherwise. That's the key point. So the repentance they were preaching, the kingdom they were preaching, until they would hear otherwise. 
And we now know throughout the book of Acts that Paul comes and tells them. That there's a little bit more to it. Exactly. But all I'm just trying to say is I defend the 12 that they were faithful oh, to right. what they had to do at that time. Because Christ left them with very specific instructions. Nice. And they were faithful to those. And therefore, chapter uh, verse 2 of chapter 1 is important because he gave them specific commandments to the apostles that he chose. And look at verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. Uh, I think that verse is very important from an apologetics perspective, by the way. Because why does it say infallible proofs? Because it's trying to tell you that Jesus did things to prove his resurrection. Which yes. is, they touched him, they ate with him. Yeah. They didn't see a ghost. Yeah. So that's important. But anyway, that's a side issue from apologetics. So this is, he presented himself to them, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to what? To the kingdom of God. Because that's what the Old Testament predicted. Christ so it, was faithful to what the Old Testament said. And the Old Testament said that the Jewish responsibility is to reach the nations based upon God's process and purpose. Yes. So, Kenneth, so when we see the model in Jerusalem of like all the believers then gave up everything. So it's like they lived lived like communists i mean true communists yeah, didn't they? yeah 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 i mean lenin was there that, that's right yeah so that but that was only that was to be a more the idea was that was to be a model for the kingdom to come yeah yeah, yeah. again it's anticipation of this so i don't need things it's part of the discipleship jesus said to people leave this leave what you have and and and, and, and you know follow me type of thing so yeah i mean it doesn't tell us specifically what the mindset was, but the message was very clear. Because, as I said, again, if you believe the kingdom being a spiritual thing and not a physical thing, then people will just skim over that verse. I don't understand it. You, you might have another pastor that will just say, oh, it's just a general term. I'm saying I don't believe it's general. And you can disagree with me. It's fine. But Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples. He gave them very specific commandments. And he spoke to them of things pertaining to the kingdom. We're going to get there when we get to verse 6. So what is he talking about? He's talking about what the Old Testament clearly taught would come, which is that the world will be saved through Israel reaching them as a light to the Gentiles. Christ was to be a light to the Gentiles. Israel was to be light to the Gentiles. Nothing yet is saying Israel's cut off and not the light to the Gentiles. Nothing here is saying to us Gentiles are incorporated into this collective church where everyone's going to hold hands and eat bacon together. Nothing saying that. It's all still part of the process of the Old Testament. This is my argument. You don't have to agree, but I'm saying that's what I see here clearly. And I have to defend these men. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Which, is, of course, you'll find in John chapter 16. Because Pentecost was not random. Pentecost was the appointed time. The Feast of Pentecost was the appointed time. Both the fact that it's the appointed time, but also the perfect purpose, because more Jews would have been in Jerusalem during Pentecost than many other times. So if you're going to reach people with the ushering in of the time of the Spirit, the best time is when? Pentecost. Also, what is quite interesting is from a rabbinical perspective, most Jews believe that Pentecost was the time when the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was made with Israel. And it's quite interesting that there are similarities between the day of Pentecost and actually what happened at Mount Sinai. You had fire, you had smoke, you had rumblings, you had 3,000 dying and you had 3,000 being saved. There's a few connections there, which is quite interesting, but that's a different story. Let's look at verse 5. But John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I find that quite interesting. Because how, did, how were they baptized with the Holy Spirit, by the way? 
were they immersed into the Holy Spirit or did it they... descended upon them? Yeah, it descended. It's, it's quite funny that it's not saying you immersed into the Holy Spirit, it just says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Because baptism immediately, when we think baptism, all we think is water. Baptism means to be identified with. That's what it actually means in the fullness of the sense. So it's quite interesting that it, you, um, Luke is speaking about John's baptism and then linking it with the Holy Spirit as well, which is quite interesting. And then look at verse 6. This is quite important, which is always the thrust of my argument with Acts chapter 1. So you spend 40 days with Jesus. He tells you everything you need to know. He opens the scriptures to you. And what's the first question you ask him before he ascends into heaven? Look at verse 6. Because that connects no, not, it connects with verse 3, by the way. So look at verse 3. Um, he spent 40 days with him, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What was the only thing they were thinking about? What was their only focus? The was kingdom. the kingdom. Because that's all they were taught. Earth, it was all what they things. It's all about the expectation. And, and it's true, man. It, it was earthly things, but nothing there was not spiritual. It wasn't the fact that they were concerned just with lack of spirituality. Not at all. No. Because in, in their thinking, what they're waiting for is the Messiah to return to restore earth. And but when we, is the we're time? still asking all those questions day by day, we still yeah. we still, but we have a bit more knowledge than they had, yeah, yeah, because they only have a limited understanding of the time of the time they knew what they needed to know. This is my big argument with why the ascension was important because Christ had promised that he's going to ascend to give them time to go out and preach and to reach people. There was a great thrust for the kingdom message. In the early parts of Acts. Look at Acts. So Acts chapter 3 got the miracle um, at the beautiful gate. You have other miracles taking place. You have a lot of things happening in this first part of Acts, which is a sign of this sort of kingdom thrust of the message. And so, again, the question I raise and ask is, what did the disciples know? What were they thinking about? What were they being taught because they weren't being rebellious. They weren't sort of, oh, Christ was teaching them all these wonderful Christian truths, and they were just focused on the kingdom stuff. That's not what it's saying. They are being 100% faithful to the process and structure of the Old Testament, which teaches that the world will be reached. Because when you look at verse 6, the reason why the disciples make the statement is not because they are selfish, but because they are evangelistic. Because they knew. So when the kingdom comes to Israel, it will be the salvation of the world. You can read about that in Romans 11. Even Paul writes about that. If they're cutting off be salvation to the world, what will their renewal or what will their ingathering be but life from the dead? And so the, the, the disciples understood that if the kingdom comes, the world's going to be reached. So we're ready to go out and we are absolutely motivated. Jesus would not be motivating the, uh, the, the disciples by saying to them, yeah, you know what? You're going to go out preaching to these Jews, but you know what? They're not interested. They're blind. They cut off. You're wasting your time. We're going to go out to the Gentiles. How motivating would that be for Peter? What did it take for Peter to go and speak to a Gentile in Acts chapter 10? So Christ couldn't say what we know to the disciples. He stuck to the prophetic plan until the time was right to bring in the bigger picture of where Christianity would go. And this would be my argument. And therefore, when you go to verse 7, it says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 to 4. So Matthew 16, 1 to 4. And I'm just questioning this times and seasons, as if no one's going to know. And, and the reason why I say that is, just be, as you go there, I think it's very clear, I mean, you read Scripture, that the second coming is not imminent.
What I mean by that is that there are certain things that must be fulfilled before the second coming takes place. If you read the book of Revelation, it's not the fact that Jesus in the second coming will come because you don't have Antichrist, you don't have tribulation, you don't have um, him going into the temple, you don't have any of that stuff. So you still need things to be fulfilled. You still got Daniel 70 weeks on the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. So what is imminent is the rapture of the church because that has no prophecy connected to it. But what is not imminent is the second coming. Yeah. Because the second coming has a very specific structure that prepares people for it. Jesus speaks about that in Matthew 24. He actually tells you exactly what is to come. So are you saying that the... Um, the disciples would have known from Jesus's teaching that there were to be all these events. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. They wouldn't have known about the the interval between their own time and the fulfillment of that. Yeah, I think it's more specific to the timing because they knew the tribulation would come, and they knew then the second coming is um, after the tribulation. That they know. But what they didn't know is exactly the timing of how long it will take for the tribulation to be ushered in. And they and, didn't actually know that it would be set aside for the Gentiles. Yeah, 100%. So I think Christ was specifically referring to the fact that you don't know exactly when things will kick off. And, and, and while you wait for this, you've got to do your work type of thing. Because look at, I just want to look at Matthew 16 where it says, um, verse 1 to 4, it says, He also said to his disciples, There are certain, there's a certain rich man. Oh, that's just Luke. Sorry, uh, Matthew. Matthew, sorry, Kenneth. I mean, Luke, while I'm talking. Miriam? <laughs> I sorry. I know it's not you. I just love talking to you. And I'm like in Luke, and I'm like, oh, all, all over the place. But look, it says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing him, ask, and asked that he should show them a sign from heaven. And he, said, and he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather. For the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. And of course, he's referring to mostly the first coming in the sense of Christ is now here and they can't assess the time but the disciples didn't ask will you restore the kingdom in the sense of um we don't know the general structure and jesus wasn't saying that it's not for you know to, to know the times and seasons because you know what the prophets say so okay. what, what he's asking what they what, what, he's, what christ is referring to is they don't know the specifics of what is going to kick off the prophetic clock so they would have known like yeah i could we could have asked them at the time like, you know that the 70th week is still yeah. got... Yeah. You know that. But then, so then what What Christ is saying is, yeah, but that, look, that's, in a way, in a roundabout way, that's not kicking off yet. Exactly. It? They don't know how long they have to preach for in the sense of before yeah. the, the prophetic clock starts ticking with the 70th week. And he says, don't worry about that. Your focus now is to go out and preach the gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's your focus. Your focus is not to worry about and, times and seasons. And you're to go out and preach the gospel. When we say the gospel, we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah, gospel of the kingdom at the time, 100%. But you just go out and you reach people. Don't, yeah. be, don't be concerned about anything else. It's in the hands of the Father, right. the specifics of the when. The and how that is clear in Scripture. It's the when that they weren't aware of. Would you say that also in a way, applies to us in the church as well, because we don't know when... Spot do on. Our, our job is not to basically be sort of stargazers no. to figure out exactly. That's not your purpose. I we mean, we, the general, yeah, I mean, we, it's we, not for us to know the specifics. For us, we can sort of say, we can look to Matthew 16 to apply it to us today as well, say, look, all the there are a lot of things, but we can't be precise to no, say... No. And, and and what's always funny prophetically is people want to jump the gun and be the first one to have said something. And I'm just like, I'm so tired of that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so pathetic. Like, who can be first to make a prediction and hope it comes true? And if it doesn't come true, no one comes back to them because they know they can't get stoned. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's just madness. But 
this is the key point, is that there was a prophetic flow that I leave with you to think through and chew on. There was a prophetic flow, and the prophetic flow was the Old Testament anticipation of the kingdom was there right throughout the Gospels. Then the cross was part of the kingdom because you need the Messiah to come back as a suffering Messiah. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. He has to die. So the prophetic flow is the anticipation of the kingdom, the Messiah dies, and then there is a gap before the tribulation in a general sense. And then the second coming takes place afterwards. That's the general prophetic flow that the disciples were aware of and thinking through. And that's very, very important. And so when Christ is saying, it's not for you to know the times and seasons, I'm ascending into heaven, I'm going to fulfill a very specific purpose there. And then the time will come and you will see the time when things start kicking off. But until that time, you just focus on what I've called you to do. And you can actually use what Jesus says to Peter there, because Peter's concerned about John and how John's going to die. And Jesus is like, don't worry about John. You just focus on what you need to do. And I think and it's, Kenneth, a, it's a great reminder. Mm. For me, for me in, in just looking at Acts 1, um, and I, yeah, that whole of that verse 8, but key for me is you shall be witnesses to me. Mm. So They'd spent the, all that time with Jesus. So he's now appointing them to go out and yeah. be, to be, the, his be his witnesses. Mm -hmm. 100%. That's really all they had. That, that For me, that's all he told them to do. It is. Be my witnesses. Yes, but the question is, witnesses to what? To his coming and his death and his resurrection. I guess. Yes. And to whom? The Jews. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm not I'm not saying that's not the case because mm. for me he says um when they say to him, Lord, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? He says it's not for you to know, but you're going to receive power mm. and go out and be witnesses to me. Yes. He's not saying only go to, but I think it was understood at that time. Jesus never went out looking for Gentiles. He didn't. To, well. to witness to. And he had all these guys with him. It was never spoken about in any of the Gospels. That because, because who's at the center of the kingdom ministry, Melody? Who are the priests in the kingdom? So when you look at, when you look at Exodus what, what, 19 verse 6. They are yes, the priests. Yes. They are the ones who are the legs to drive the kingdom forward. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no, they were no. always God's vehicle 100%. for bringing his and so, story and his it, mission to the world. And so with the, with the ascension, it's what Jesus leaves them with to do that they do faithfully. Yeah. Until yeah. something new is later on revealed. That's the driving force here. Because they Absolutely. weren't thinking, no, of, I get it. I, they weren't I, thinking of United it. Church. They, they weren't thinking of that. So you're 100% correct. They had to be witnesses, but witnesses to what? An anticipation of what? Not an anticipation of a church that is united. That wasn't their focus at the time. They weren't building churches. Absolutely. They, their focus they, was only to they get They were witnesses to the people who already had all of the Old Testament teaching. Yes. And eventually it will go out, yeah. but but but, yeah, but yeah. the Lord wanted them to focus on one group for now, and the message then gets momentum to go on. It's just the thinking often people have is once this happens, now we've got this church where everyone's just coming together. No, 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 no. because that's not what they were told. And in fact, you can actually see how wonderful it was that the Lord took Saul stroke Paul yes, yes. because of his huge knowledge he was be in of the of the 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 five books and the psalms and the proverbs he was be able he was able to piece it all together he was but he also wasn't with them so the reason also why he was chosen is because he was a bit of a he was outside of the 12 so it was a lot easier for god to instruct him in something new than taking okay. peter 
and basically say to Peter, well, everything there is actually going to change. So God kept the momentum for the 12 to keep doing their thing. Yes. And then he brings in Paul saying, you've come from a completely different place. Yes, you know the Old Testament, but I'm going to share this with you. And you're going to go to the 12 and say, guys, we're going with this, but we're also going to move on to the something else. Okay. He couldn't, he couldn't change course with the 12. He had to bring no. in a, another guy to get yeah. them to, to see the bigger picture. So let's turn to eight. Let's look at verse eight, because this is important to me, because it's, as Melody said so, so rightly, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And the question I always ask is, why the process? Because Luke shares exactly the same process in Luke 24, when he says, and this message will be preached, but it will start in Jerusalem. Well, because God's heart is for his kingdom, for his yeah, people. Yeah. But I think, there's a, the I, I think there's a practical reason why. I don't think it's just spiritual. I think it's spiritual, yes, but I think there's a practical reason why. And the reason practically why is because there were people already there who had witnessed either the crucifixion or what was happening at the time already. So it was yeah. easier to minister and get momentum into this message. So yes, there was a spiritual purpose in the bigger picture of Israel, yes, but there was also the fact that it's easier to speak to people at that time who already knew something. And so it was sort of a warm center to prepare things going forward. Instead of just sending them out to Gentiles I mean, indiscriminately, and they don't know anything about the Old Testament. They don't know anything. So it took time to minister to people that knew something. And yeah. they would then gain momentum in, in getting the message. So I think there was a practical purpose as well. It's just what I try and highlight is the fact that the Great Commission had a very specific focus to it. And people are thinking, oh, well, the Great Commission is just for everyone. We just go out and share that's nice and cute, but it's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a very specific structured process that starts in Jerusalem, goes to Judea, goes to Samaria, and then will reach the world. We are the wasn't world it, now. Wasn't it also the timing? Because with it being Passover and all the people from many different parts were in Jerusalem. 100%. 100%. That, and, and when the Holy Spirit came, and then those people went away with some, yeah? 100%. Okay. 100%. What I just leave with with you generally on that, uh, with, with everyone here is also, I would want someone to find one quote in the epistles of Paul speaking about the Great Commission. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Give me one epistle where Paul says, remember the great commission that we must fulfill. Where he says that but to I, Gentiles. I don't understand what your rationale is in terms of, I, I know what you're saying, but I don't, I mean, what's the difference? You know, pe people think Jesus came, he died, and he went up to heaven. And then the message went out. Yeah. So I, I understand that's not that what there Acts was a says. process. That's, that's not what Acts says. No, there was a process. Okay. Yes. That I understand. But I don't understand the point you're trying to make. What I'm saying is that the purpose of the Great Commission was fulfilled in the 12. It's not the church's responsibility to fulfill because we can't. Ah, okay. Got okay. it. Because the church is not responsible for going Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Because we are the uttermost parts of the earth. Yeah. So the Great Commission is very specific for a time in the book of Acts to be fulfilled to get the message out. Once the message is out, you can't fulfill the Great Commission anymore. And so everyone drives home that the church's responsibility is to fulfill the Great Commission. My question would be, where does Paul say that to non-Jewish churches ever that they must fulfill the Great Commission? He never quotes Matthew 28. Okay. Because the, the church's responsibility is to share the gospel where they are. Yeah. 
it's not always our responsibility to go out. Missionaries go out, that's fine. But people have this thinking that it's every church's responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. It becomes this thing that I don't see in Scripture. What I, is, that, is that saying evangelism is wrong or not? No, not at all. I said the Great yeah. Commission is not evangelism. Okay. So, so when the... When did the Great Commission, as it were, I'm going to put my foot in it here. Mm. When did the Great Commission, in terms of Acts, come to an end? When did it come to an end? Well, I would say that Acts chapter 10 is sort of when the Gentiles hear, and then you start seeing things changing. Okay, I heard you right. Okay, thanks. So Acts chapter 2 is the Jews hearing. Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans hear. Acts chapter 10, the door is open to the Gentiles. Acts 13 as well. Once that door is open... It's opened the door. And so the churches then that are out there are not, what, how, where do they go? How do I fulfill, if I'm sitting in Turkey, how do I fulfill the Great Commission? Yeah. It doesn't make yeah. sense. And I'm just saying, I'm not, there's not an indictment on sharing the gospel or all evangelism. It's just the, the Great Commission was very timeous and specific. And it's the same as the cross. We can't reenact the cross. You can't reenact Pentecost. You can't reenact the Great Commission during the book of Acts being fulfilled for the purpose of reaching people, which we are reached now. The yeah. church's responsibility is to share the gospel to every creature in a general sense. You can use Mark 16 if you want to. But I'm just saying that if you look at a church's marching orders generally, what we believe and what we must do, and everyone drives home, Matthew 28, we must fulfill the Great Commission. And my question would just be, if it is that important, every single church's structure, why does Paul never mention it to the Corinthians, never to the Galatians, never to the Ephesians, never to the Colossians or Philippians? He doesn't even say that to Timothy or Titus to remind the congregation to do it. When in the book of Acts, we, we read of uh, Paul going to the synagogues first. Mm -hmm. That what's take what's happening with Paul's ministry now is actually we're in that transition now where you've got like you know the church the 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 message to the Gentiles and the church has been set up happening at the same time well sort of this kingdom still being preached is that yeah I, I think I think there's an element to that but you you won't find Paul taking Titus to the Jew first no no because Titus is a Gentile. Paul had access. So if you've got access, then go and preach to them. It's not a problem. But as the church becomes more Gentile, yeah. then things completely change. So, 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 so Paul was a Jew. He had access. He's going to go to, because at the synagogues, I mean, you read Acts, at the synagogues, Gentiles were standing around. They wanted to believe. So if right. you're going to reach people, those are people that are super hungry for the word. Yeah. Why, why go and stand and speak at the, on a street corner to a tree worshiper? And it's been very unkind to the Gentile. They would used to worship more idols. But you understand the point. Why mm. do I go into a city going to spend time at the pagan temple? You don't find Paul preaching outside the temple of Aphrodite or Diana. Right. Where is he going to go? He's going to go to the local synagogue because non-Jews who are interested will be standing there. Jews who are either believers or interested are there. And that's the best place for you to start preaching. Mind you, he did go and have conversations with the philosophers. Yes, they actually called him. Okay. So if you read the text, he was just talking to people, and then someone heard him speak. And yeah, and they invited. They called him. He didn't go and meet with them. They called him. No, he, he didn't go. And, he didn't uh, but, invite but, himself. <laughs> yep. Paul's gospel was not the gospel of the kingdom. No, it wasn't. So he, he, I mean, he could preach that to anybody. Yes. But the majority of the Jews had Peter's gospel and accepted Peter's gospel. Yeah, 100%. And, were ex and are expecting the kingdom and are destined but, but, for the but, kingdom. Yes, but Paul still went just preaching Christ and him crucified. And yes. repentance. So that's what he, he did. He went to the Jews and he preached Christ crucified to them. And therefore, they yeah. wanted to stone him and kill him. So I think it was a general aspect there as well. But I 100% agree with you know, that difference between the gospel, the of grace, and the kingdom. But let's let's move on to verse 9. 
Because again, I, I think the Great Commission is very important in verse 8, and you can work through it. I just believe there's a very specific process that we see fulfilled in, in one sense in the book of Acts, and I believe in the tribulation will be fulfilled as well. But let's look at verse 9 and then 10 to 11. So if you look at verse 9, it says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So what normally happens is with the ascension, people think there was literally like a cloud, like a physical cloud that rains. And Jesus put his feet on this cloud, and this cloud took him out into the heavenlies. Um, I would debate that issue because I think the cloud there is far more related to angels and God's glory than a physical rainy cloud. So turn with me to Hebrews 12, 1. This is an interesting thought because we have this picture in the, in the children's Bible, Jesus sort of on this cloud drifting up into the heavenlies. And I'm like, ah. Oh. I'm just like, no. It would be far more glorious than that. What was Hebrews chapter? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us and let us run and in, with endurance the race that is set before us. So cloud is used for witnesses. Angels are also referred to as a cloud. And therefore, when Christ ascends into the heaven, this picture of just stepping on a cloud, I think, is not what it was. I think there was glory involved. It was magnificent. And angelic hosts and God's glory took him up into the heaven. So just the picture is more glorious than just sort of disciples hanging around, Jesus putting his foot on a cloud, the cloud like a little sort of aeroplane taking up. It's just not the picture. It's not. So I would imagine... Yes, I'm just imagining that the cloud is there because it's it's because because of God's glory. Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's, it's hiding. It's almost hidden from the eyes. Yeah, well, um, it's definitely and I'm a glory back cloud. To, hmm. I'm thinking back to Old Testament somewhere, Moses, and you know God being hidden. Yeah, Moses hiding his face from the glory. Mm. Yes, but I think this would have been far more glorious because who, if you look at verse 10, and while I'm sort of building on this, look at verse 10, mm. it says, and as they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, who stood there? Angels. Two men stood by them in white apparel. So it was, in my opinion, based upon the text, far more glorious than what it's perceived. Which glory? Sorry. Which is Sorry, would yeah, this yeah. glory be then apparent to everybody in Jerusalem? Oof. I, I mean, that would be a guess. I'm not, I don't know. But I, no. I just think that there's an element there of the Mount of Transfiguration and, and seeing the glory of Christ. Because if you look at, we look at Luke 24, afterward they were worshipping. So when you look back at Luke 24, very briefly, yes. um, So Luke 24, um, it says here in verse uh, 51, Now it came to pass while he blessed them, and he, and he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So I think there was, there was a lot of glory connected to it, which I just want to leave with you. And then the most exciting part is verse 10 to 11. So again, we read, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Where was he ascending from? It was the Mount of Olives. So let's, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 14. If you go back to the Old Testament, it should sort of be, be nearer, Matthew. Yep. Zechariah is one of the easier ones to find. It's the other minor prophets that become the panic stations. Try and find that very quickly behind the pulpit. It's super nerve-wracking. Um, Zechariah 14, verse 1 to 4. 
Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken and the houses rivaled and the woman ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. The anticipation here in the ascension is that Christ will in like manner return and return to the very same place that he ascended from. But he doesn't return in the same manner as in how he will look. Because when he returns, he returns in judgment. He returns mm. to fight against the enemies of Israel. He returns to bring peace and equity and justice and righteousness to earth. I wonder what that, uh, uh, and the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. I wonder what that what that's referring to as when he fought in the day yeah, of battle. Yeah, I don't know. I think it could be sort of a clear Old Testament reference there. Maybe the angels that took out. Yeah, the yeah. The Lord, I think there's Lord. also quite a few references to sort of um, Joshua as well. Mm -hmm. In the Lord fought and slay um, all those men. Mm -hmm. Joshua, there was a 300,000 mm -hmm. as well. So I think there's there's a reference there as well. Yeah. I just think we've, mm. we've become so soft about Jesus. We've made him this... I'm saying we, I'm mm -hmm. talking yeah, about no, no. humanity. Mm -hmm. We've made him this, this, um, I don't know, soft um, figure of love, and we've forgotten his power. Mm -hmm. We have. Which, which for me is like the ascension. These men standing, mm -hmm. looking, he's taken from them. He's so holy as he ascends that they can't even see him anymore it's like his holiness is just too much for their eyes yeah yeah and i think there was a reminder to them because not all of them were there at the mount of transfiguration so transfiguration yeah. you only had peter james and john there that's right so i think many and the disciples weren't just at the time the eleven. Judas was 120, 120 was it? so there were more there and they would have seen this this glory and been in absolute awe and anticipation of what is to come mm. it's very very significant so that's why again theologically the ascension is very important in the fact of christ's heavenly ministry which is something that the book of hebrews highlights it's something that paul highlights it's something that we have to be reminded of of, of christ's heavenly position his heavenly ministry and our blessings in him but the ascension is also very important to help us to understand a bit more of the prophetic understanding of what the disciples knew at the time and why the book of Acts. So why I'm driving this home is that when we read the book of Acts, why the apostles did what they did was because that was the clear instructions to them. Mm. At no point are they outside of God's will in what they're doing. And God's mm. will was that the message go to, to the Jew first and then it will reach the Gentiles for a purpose. And therefore, when Paul the Apostle comes on the scene and basically instructs Peter in what the fullness of the message will be, Peter understands that based upon many circumstances. And that's when Christianity really gets momentum to what we know it to be. But the first part was very important to build a foundation before anything could happen. It had to be the fulfillment of what Christ had commanded. And therefore, I leave this with you. When you read Matthew 24... And, and Christ speaks about many things, it relates far more to maybe the early part of Acts and also the tribulation than general Christianity because of the timing of things, which I just want to leave with you. And then finally, 
is that Christ's work was complete. The Holy Spirit now has come. He is fulfilling his ministry among us, which is very exciting because it was important for Christ to say that, that I need to go so the comforter can come. It's almost a, there's a enthusiasm from Christ's part for the comforter to come because it's something unique and special and dynamic in our lives so we, that we can live the Christian life with the power that God gives us to do so because he's at work in our hearts and lives, which is very, very exciting. So we're going to close in prayer and then leave it to questions. Uh, but we just want to close the recording. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the conversations we could have. And we just thank you, Lord, as we consider these important verses, that we can think through them. And that it's a bit more than just sometimes what we think we know based upon what we've been taught to just simplify things. Sometimes things aren't as simple. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated because it's life. It's you're dealing with people, and people are complicated and complex. But thank you, Lord, that you've given to us instruction, and we can work through it and, and, and grow together as we understand your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your position in the heavenlies. Thank you that you have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and that we are seated with you in heavenly in the heavenlies position. And we thank and praise you for it. Help us to live for your honor and glory so that we live like those who are seated with you. And help us to be mindful of things of heaven and not be consumed by the things of this earth. As we thank you, Lord, for what you have shared with us tonight. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.